is going to be a review of uh, chapters 19, 20, 21. And we're going to introduce uh, cost, volume, profit analysis, which is from chapter 22. In managerial accounting, we're focusing on this part of the income statement. Sales minus cost of goods sold gives us gross profit, minus SG&A gives us operating income. And we decided to figure out what it cost us to make our stuff, we got to sort the period cost from the product cost. And we said that any cost inside the factory is a product cost. And that'll be included as part of the cost of making our thing, whatever our thing is. And then those costs, costs are going to flow through our T accounts. And these are always the same. We have raw materials, factory labor, and manufacturing overhead. So we're going to take materials, labor, and overhead. It's going to move into work in process. Then that's going to move into finished goods. And finally, we're going to sell our stuff. And that's when these costs finally hit the income statement. In the meantime, they're all in inventory. Stuff we're going to work on, stuff we're working on, stuff we're finished working on. Finally, we sell it, and now it hits the income statement. And chapter 20 was about uh, job order costing. So if we're building a house in San Lorenzo and a house in Blackhawk, we'd keep track of those jobs separately so we knew how much it cost us to make each house. And the uh, only tricky part about job order costing was the manufacturing overhead. Materials are easy to track. We asked Ralph, he's in charge of our materials over there, how many materials got checked out onto the factory floor. We looked at the time cards, how many direct labor hours went here. The problem is the overhead. That's just a guess. And so we said at the beginning of the year, we'll sit down, take our total estimated overhead for the year, and divide it by our driver. The driver might be labor hours, might be labor costs, might be machine hours, might be kilowatts of electricity. It depends on the nature of our business. Whatever we think is a good uh, factor for determining how much overhead got used on a particular job. And we also said that indirect materials come out of here and come down here. Indirect labor comes out of here and down of here. Indirect materials are things like nails, lacquer, small little things that we're not going to bother to keep track of throughout. We're just going to apply them through our overhead rule. Indirect labor are people that aren't working directly on the stuff. So the uh, supervisors or the quality control uh, inspectors, they come down here and their salaries get applied using our overhead application rate. And so that was uh, job order costing. And then we said, well, if we make the steady stream of, of the same thing over and over again, maybe it would help management if instead of job order costing, we use process costing. Now, there's no rule that says you absolutely have to use job order costing or you absolutely have to use uh, process costing. But if we're making a steady stream of the same stuff, maybe the best way to help management is to keep track of this stuff by process. So instead of every job, every month, we prepare a report that tells management how much it should cost us to make our stuff in process number one and in process number two. And chapter 21 said, boy, it would really be easy if we finished everything every month. For example, if we spent a million dollars in process number one to make a million units, there was no beginning work in process, there was no ending work in process, then we'd know that it was $1 per unit. Unfortunately, we don't finish everything every month, so there's beginning work in process, there's ending work in process, and we have to figure out exactly how much work we did at what cost. And that's where equivalent units came in. So 1,000 units that are 50% complete are the same as 500 complete units. And we looked at it from the point of view of direct materials and conversion costs. Said that these guys here were conversion costs because we take them, 
we apply them to the raw materials and we convert those raw materials into something else. And the reason that we break these things out is because these get added at separate rates in time. So the, uh, last week we said if we had, if we're making chocolate chip cookies, we'd add everything at the beginning. But the conversion cost, the labor of mixing the stuff up, the labor of baking the cookies, that happens later on. So materials and conversion costs are at different times during the process. So to get the best feel for how much work we did every month, we look at work from the equivalent units of direct materials and equivalent units of conversion costs. All right, let's do a problem together to review process costing. So lasting memories makes photographic paper for printing digital images in a two-step process. In the first process, paper stock is coated with chemicals. All direct materials are added at the beginning of the process. So once we start on these uh, uh, papers, all the direct materials are added. So they're 100% complete as soon as we start on them. The conversion costs are added evenly throughout the process. In the second process, the paper is dried and packaged. So at the beginning of the June, there's no beginning working process. So remember under the uh, weighted average method, which we learned in this class, the work that we do is the units transferred out and working in an inventory but we would include the cost from last month in our costs. In this example, there are no costs from last month because there's no beginning working process. They give us a million units here at the beginning of the month, and we transfer out 900,000 units to process two. So that means there's 100,000 units left. They gave us a million, we transferred out 900, that means there's 100,000 units left. And even a marketing major can do that calculation. We have to figure out how many dollars went with those units and how many dollars stayed with these 100,000 units. It tells us that uh, the remaining units are 30% complete as far as conversion costs go. And they tell us that we brought in a million dollars worth of direct materials. We brought in $360,000 worth of labor and a million five hundred thousand dollars worth of overhead was applied into process number one. So that means a million dollars of materials came in, $360,000 of direct labor came in, and a million five hundred thousand dollars of manufacturing overhead was applied. And our job is to figure out how many dollars went with those 900,000 units and how many of those dollars stayed with uh, those guys. So let's figure out how much work we did. So for the units transferred out, 900,000 equivalent units worth of work. We can't transfer them out if they aren't complete. How many equivalent units worth of work did we do with the stuff that's in ending work in process? Well, those 100,000 units, they're 100% complete as far as materials go, because materials are added at the beginning of the process. So that means our equivalent units worth of work that we did this month as far as materials go are 1 million. Conversion costs, those 100,000 units are 30% complete as far as conversion costs. 100,000 units that are 30% complete are the same as 30,000 units. So that means we did $930,000, 930,000 equivalent units worth of work. Now let's look at the dollars, the costs. So we spent a million dollars on materials. And then a million 860 on conversion costs. That's the 360 plus the 1 million five that got moved in there. So our cost per unit, Spend a million dollars on a million equivalent units worth of work, so that's one dollar. We spend a million eight sixty to do nine hundred thirty thousand equivalent units worth of work, so that's two dollars. So to make a unit during this month, it was one dollar for materials, two dollars for conversion costs, or total three. 
So how many dollars went on to the next process? So transferred out is three dollars times nine hundred thousand, which is two million seven hundred thousand. And in ending work in process, we've got a hundred thousand units. That cost us a dollar for direct materials. Plus, we've got thirty thousand equivalent units. That cost us two dollars. So that becomes uh, 100,000 plus 60,000 or 100, $160,000. And that's all there is to process costing. The only tricky part that we didn't talk about is if there were beginning dollars in here, we have to remember how much was materials and how much was conversion costs, and they would get added in here to our costs and get averaged in with this month's work, okay? So that was a review of process costing, which is chapter 21. Let's go on to chapter 22, which is cost, volume, profit analysis. We're going to, as I say, in managerial accounting, spend a lot of energy looking at this notion of operating income. And chapter 22, says let's break our costs down just a little bit differently. Sales minus variable costs is going to give us our contribution margin. Minus fixed costs is going to give us operating income. Same number, we ended up operating income. All we did is take a little detour to get there. Instead of cost of goods sold, this is variable costs. Variable costs are costs that vary in proportion to sales. That's gonna give us contribution margin minus fixed costs. Those are costs that don't vary in proportion to sales. We're still gonna end up here at operating income. And the reason we do this is it allows us to do some quick and dirty analysis, make some predictions about what happens to operating income if we increase our prices, if we decrease our fixed costs, we can do it just like that. All right, so the three kinds of costs are the fixed costs. So if this is our sales down here. A fixed cost doesn't vary in proportion to sales. It might change, might go up or down, but it doesn't vary in proportion to sales. So in my video, I say if I have an airline and I depreciate my airline, airplanes on a straight line basis, doesn't matter how many miles I fly, that depreciation expense is the same. If I sell a plane, depreciation expense goes down. If I buy a plane, depreciation expense goes up. So fixed doesn't mean unchanging. It just means it doesn't vary in proportion to sales. And then there's variable costs. And they do vary in proportion to sales. And an uh, example in my video is the fuel cost. So uh, the more tickets I sell, the more miles I fly, the more fuel I use, the uh, fuel cost is a variable cost. And then the tricky one is a mixed cost. So if this is our sales here, it has a fixed component and a variable component. And sometimes it's obvious. So I'm an airline and I say to the Oakland airport, I'll pay you $10,000 a year just for the right to, to uh, land at your airport. And I'll pay you $1,000 every time we dock at one of your gates. So the more times I dock at the gates, the higher the variable cost, but that $10,000 is a fixed cost. And sometimes it's not obvious what the breakdown is, but our intuition tells us that it's a fixed cost so we have two ways to do that artificially, if you will. One is the high-low method. The high-low method looks at the highest cost and the lowest cost. In this example, would be this and this. And it assumes that that difference is the variable portion and everything else must be the fixed portion. So there's a video on Canvas that walks you through how to do that. 
The other way to do it is the more sophisticated way is regression analysis. And so what it does is it doesn't just look at the two data points, it looks at a bunch of data points and then draws a line that best fits that data and to tell, to make an estimate of what the fixed cost is and what the variable cost is. All right, so those are the costs. That, and, the, and the reason we have to do this, by the way, is because if you look over here, there's no place in here for fixed cost, for um, mixed cost. So we'll have to stick the variable up here and the fixed in here so we can use our new system. All right, so what is this new system? And in the video I talk about, I have my own wine store and my rent is $100 a month. Well, that's a fixed, that's a fixed cost. That $100 a month is a fixed cost. Whether I sell one bottle of wine or 10,000 bottles of wine, my rent is, uh, is $100 a month. And then in the video I say, if every bottle of wine I sell for 20 bucks and every bottle of wine costs me 10 bucks, that's a variable cost right there. Then I have $10 of contribution margin. So that's my unit contribution margin. Each unit I make $10. So how many units do I have to sell to break even? 10, I take my fixed costs, which are expressed in dollars, divide up my unit, divide it by unit contribution margin, which is also in dollars, and that gives me my break even in units. In this example, that would be my $100 per month divided by $10, means I gotta sell 10 bottles. And you can always test this stuff. The whole point of chapter 22 is it's quick and dirty, but you could always, if you want to, multiply everything out. You could say, well, if I sell 10 bottles, then my sales will be 10 times 20 is 200. My uh, variable costs, 10 times 10 is be 100. That would give me contribution margin of 100 minus my fixed costs, which is the 100, gives me a break even. I just break even. If we wanna know uh, the break even point but expressed in sales dollars instead, we change this thing here to be percentages. So everything expressed as a percentage of sales Sales is 100% of itself. $10 is 50% of that. And our contribution margin is 50%. Same formula, except we're gonna get the same answer in a different form. So take your fixed cost, divide it by your contribution margin ratio. So the only difference is that word ratio. So it's a percentage now, and that gives us our break even in dollars. And what's that look like? Take your $100 fixed costs, divide it by your contribution margin ratio, 50% is 0 0.5. $100 divided by 0.5 is $200. Yeah, we already know that that's correct because we figured it out down here when we were testing our 10 units to break even. And did we go into business just to break even? No, we went into business to make money. So if we wanna hit a target operating income, we simply add that to the numerator before we do this calculation. And that'll tell us what, how many units we have to sell to hit that target income. Or if we wanna know it in sales dollars, the uh, sales dollars we have to sell to hit that target operating income. And your book from time to time says net income. Well, yeah, it really is a net income because there's also uh, selling old equipment. Uh, there's also uh, interest expense, things like that, that factor into net income that really don't fit into the categories of variable costs or fixed costs. So I'm going to pretty consistently say operating income. Please don't get discouraged if your book says net income. 
And then the last concept is margin safety. So if I tell you I have sales of $300 right now, and we know the break even is 200, my margin of safety is 100. In other words, my sales can fall from 300 to 200 before I start losing money. And what we'll often do in cost volume profit analysis is we'll draw a graph. And so in one of the homework problems, you're supposed to look at a barbershop. And what'll happen is you'll have, these will be your sales down here, and these will be your, uh, I don't know what these things will be over here. These will also be dollars over here. And so the more sales you have, the more dollars you bring in, and then you're gonna have your cost structure. Say this is your fixed, and these are your variable. Well, where these things cross, that's your break even point. So in our wine shop, this would be uh, $200 worth of sales is where we cross over and we have exactly 200 and we have exactly uh, zero operating income. All right, okay, I see, I get the picture. Let's do a problem together. That's the, this thing is called uh, Green with Envy. Green with Envy provides environmentally friendly lawn services for homeowners. Its operating costs are as follows. Depreciation, $1,200 per month. Advertising, $600 per month. Insurance, $1,500 per month. Weed and feed materials, $13 per lawn. Direct labor, $12 per lawn. Fuel, $2 per lawn. Green with Envy charges $60 per treatment for the average single family lawn. Find the break even point in number of lawn service and in dollars. So let's break the cost down into a uh, fixed and variable. So we've got fixed and variable. The first one is depreciation expense. Well, no matter how many lawns I mow, that depreciation expense is $1,200. It doesn't vary in proportion to the number of lawns. Advertising, $600, same thing. The advertising expense doesn't vary in proportion to the number of lawns that I treat. Insurance, same thing, 1500 Okay, so no, no matter how many lawns I mow, my insurance expense is still 1500 And then the variable, we've got insurance, excuse me, we've got weed and feed materials of $13 per lawn. So if I do one lawn, $13. If I do two lawns, $26. If I do three lawns, $39. So that varies in proportion to sales. Direct labor, $12. And I mow one lawn, $12, two lawns, $24, three lawns, $36, blah, 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 blah. So that's a variable cost. And finally, fuel of $2 per lawn, $2. And so that varies in proportion to the lawns. So let's add these things up. What do we got here? 12, 18, and 15, is that uh, 33? And over here, 13 and 12 is 25, and 2 is 27, does that seem right? All right, so our formulas were, take your fixed costs, which are in dollars, divide it by your unit contribution margin. How much do I make on each lawn? And that'll give you the break even in units. So what do, how much do we make on each lawn? It says that we charge $60. So if we charge $60 and our variable costs are 27, I think we make 33 per lawn, is that right? 60 minus 27, 33. So if our fixed costs are 3,300 and our unit contribution margin is 33, it means we have to mow 100 lawns to break even. In other words, if we charge 60 bucks a lawn, that must mean we have $6,000 in sales. Let's test that. Let's do the same calculation, but use, unit, use contribution margin ratio. So the way that I remember this, by the way, is that these dollar signs cancel each other out so that we get the answer in units. 
If instead we divide by the contribution margin ratio, this is 100%, this is 45%, which means that that other part there should be 55%, I hope, 55%. So our contribution margin ratio is 55. So we'll divide by the contribution margin ratio. And there's no dollar sign here, so it doesn't cancel out. That'll give us our break even in dollars. So we'll take our fixed costs, 3,300, divide it by 0.55, 3,300, by 0.55, and sure enough, we get $6,000. And that's really all there is to cost volume profit analysis. Uh, books sometimes make it complicated. Uh, they, they show these complicated formulas, and really all you gotta do is remember Russ's wine shop, you've got $100 in rent, and you make $10 on each bottle of the wine you sell, we gotta sell 10 bottles to break even. Did we go into business just to break even? No, we went into business to make money. So you add the target operating income up here, do the same calculation to find out what your sales have to be to hit your target operating income. Your margin of safety is how far your sales can fall from the current level before you start to lose money. And uh, you'll often have to do a chart, like I say, where you'll have revenue and your fixed costs and your variable costs and where those cross, that's not a very good fix and variable. Where those cross, that's your break even point. Okay, that's all there is to uh, chapter 22. Thanks.